Josh, can you do me a favor real quick? Can you just send me a text? I just want to make sure it, for some reason, doesn't pop up on my uh, screen. Sure. One second. I'm going to close the shade here. OK. Good evening. Thank you everyone who is joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live for our Ground Tackle webinar with Western Region Area 3 Commodore, Chris Leverage. Chris is a just retired uh, Lieutenant Commander from the United States Coast Guard. He grew up in Sea Scouts on the Sea Scout ship Griffin in Redwood City, California. Uh, he actually recruited me into the program and we earned Quartermaster together. Uh, he is now in Alameda, California, helping uh, Northern California and uh, Nevada Sea Scouts grow and uh, sustain during the pandemic. Chris has been on everything from Coast Guard small boats to the Bark Eagle to buoy tenders. So he has lots of sea time, great experience and knowledge uh, that he's going to share with us uh, along with some recorded video clips from Sea Scouts from the Viking and Corsair of San Francisco. Uh, and we will begin in just a moment. Chris? Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone, uh, coast to coast uh, across the Sea Scout program. Um, I'm Chris Leverich. I've been a part of Sea Scouting uh, since 1986, and I quartermastered with Josh on the Griffin in Redwood City, California. Uh, tonight, we're going to cover 
ground tackle uh, components in ordinary and able. Um, and basically what tonight's content really is are the fundamentals and nomenclature for ground tackle. That's all the equipment, hardware related to anchoring. Um, and I've got a prompt here. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, and then we're going to talk about the, the hardware in context to um, basics of anchoring. So ground tackle is the equipment and hardware. Anchoring is the uh, event activity or the intent of the hardware. So these are the fundamentals and they kind of lead into um, the other components, both in ordinary and able, but they will make sense as we go through it um, because they build, uh, build on content. Okay, so resources, obviously we start with the Sea Scout manual um, and the requirements. And then of course the anchoring sections are the fundamentals that you have to be able to recite um, to get credit for the uh, requirement for advancement. Um, but they are a good basic reference, a very basic reference uh, in the world of ground tackle and anchoring. Um, of course, many of you are familiar with Chapman. Um, it's if it's not in your house or on your boat, it, it probably should be. Um, it's a great resource for a lot more expanded and it's kind of a common fundamental across the yachting, boating, and uh, you know, we even had in the Coast Guard as a, as an easy reference. Um, but there's a lot of resources online. Um, and most of you are familiar with Boat US has free instructional, um, instructional videos and programs you can take some of which qualify for state uh, voter cards, um, but nevertheless, um, it's also a good reference. And of course, the internet uh, across the board has tons and tons of resources, but take it with a grain of salt. There's a lot of opinion sewn in there. So, um, you know, kind of contrast and compare people's opinions um, about uh, seamanship and, and um, anchoring. Okay, moving forward. Okay, so I'm your live host tonight, um, and I'm Western Region Area 3, which is Northern California, Nevada. Um, we have 32 units in the area, and two of our uh, top performing units are in San Francisco, the Corsair and the Viking. And uh, so we had the youth this week, um, or this past week, help out with the presentation, describe the components um, in Alameda, California, and uh, uh, young man's name is Badwang, and the young lady's name is Kaislin. And behind the camera um, in production was Mary Kate Busher. She's quartermaster with the Viking. And uh, just so everyone knows, too, uh, because of pandemic uh, considerations, anyone on camera uh, was unmasked, uh, but at a safe distance from the rest of the crew, we were all wearing masks for the, uh, for the entirety of the production. All right, moving forward. Okay, so ordinary 8A, name the parts of a stock and stockless anchor. Um, you can see here just by the diagram, there's a significant part and you can see the stock at the top, um, but we'll let our youth take it away. All right, so this is ordinary ground tackle requirement 8A. This one is name the parts of a stock anchor and a stock is anchor. So this one is an old fashioned anchor. Uh, it has a stock. So start off, you have your ring. That's where it connects the anchor to the boat, which leads to the stock. This helps keep the anchor balanced so it prevents it from getting caught in its own uh, chain. On the ends of the stock, you have the balls. That helps prevent chasing against your own boat and holding it up. And to prevent the stock from sliding up and down in the uh, shank, you have the key. But for the newer old fashions, you would have a clamp like this one uh, compared to the old ones that leads into the shank, which is like basically the main part of the anchor. That leads into the crown. The crown helps connect the shank and the arms together. On the end of each arm, it looks like you have big hands. So on the inside, uh, these are called palms. They help catch the ground, whether it's sand, rocks, or other types of ground, I guess. And on the Backside, you have the flukes. On the ends of each um, of these palms, you have the P or a bill. And on the edge, you would call these the blades. 
and that leads to the Danforth, which is a stock Cassandra. Uh, there's this long rod right here. Some people call it a stock, some don't. It's highly debated. Uh, this is the crown here, which helps to connect everything. These two big parts are the, are the flukes. And this long part right here is the shank. Uh, let me see. Another difference is that instead of having a ring, you're just gonna have a hole which leads to the shackle. And that eventually leads on to the. All right, so this is. I wanna advance to the next page. All right. So footnotes. All right. So this is probably the, the shortest component of the, uh, the training here. Um, stock and stock list. The, in Navy is probably the more obvious answer. Um, these are the basics and nomenclature of the parts of the anchor. Um, you'll see uh, lots of variations on this. Um, lots of different companies have made these throughout the years. And um, they basically, you can define whenever you're um, looking at acquiring new anchors or uh, considering the parts, they're all pretty much uh, standard in terms of uh, the names um, that people will recognize um, in the boating community. Okay, so the next uh, element is ordinary 8B. Describe five types of anchors. Describe each type, uh, how each type uh, holds the bottom, the kind of bottom which holds best, and the advantages and disadvantages of each type. Okay, so we have an overview. Some of the uh, video elements um, are really just to cover the text that's in the manual for reference, um, but it sets the stage for talking about um, different types of anchors. Choosing the proper anchor or anchors for any given boat depends on several factors. The load that the boat may place on the anchor, the types of the bottom in which a particular anchor may be used, and the type of anchor road and anch anchoring materials. All of these are interrelated. The load that the particular boat may place on the ground tackle depends on its weight and several external conditions, such as the force created by the wind above the waterline, the currents below the waterline, and the wave action at any particular time. A good rule of thumb for cruising sailboats calls for a working anchor weighing about one pound per foot of the boat's overall length, plus a storm anchor of about twice the weight for bad weather. A lunch hook of about a half a pound per foot per foot may be satisfactory for temporary anchoring. Motor boats and centerboard sailboats may use smaller anchors. All of these weights may be reduced for the most efficient lightweight anchors and increased for the, for the Navy type ones. Check with the anchor manufacturer's recommendations before trusting the holding power of any anchor. The holding power of an anchor varies greatly with the type of bottom and the anchor that might develop 15,000 pounds of holding power in hard sand may only be able to hold 500 pounds in a load of soft sand. You cannot always tell in advance where you might anchor your ship, so you must have ground tackle available for the most difficult anchoring conditions you might face. Choosing the prop Okay, so um, just for uh, reference, obviously, uh, Unless you're a real collector, um, most people, and certainly most these scout ships, don't have every type of anchor. So what we did is we set up an arrangement of common anchor, uh, anchors we're able to find around our club. And uh, we'll go through four types of anchors um, that you saw earlier. And then we'll go into individual segments discussing uh, types that are a little less common, um, but we have footnotes for those too. This is Ordinary Ground Tackle, Requirement 8B. Describe five types of anchors, their uses, their advantages, and their disadvantages. This is an old-fashioned anchor. What's great about this is it has, the stock that it has allows it to roll and catch um, a bite within it pretty easily. It's great in most grounds. And what's cool about this one is that it can store easily. So if you took out the key, what would happen is it would come all the way out and then fold flat with the rest of the ink. And so it's good in most grounds, also like the old fashioned anchor. What's cool about this one is that the weight of its 
shank allows it to <laughs> um, and catch easily within both of its flukes. It doesn't have a great um, turn arc there, but what happens is that there's a big change is that these on the end will allow it to readjust easily and catch something else quickly. This is a Navy anchor. It works basically with just its weight. What's cool about these guys is that it has what's called shoulders that allow it to um, fall at an angle so that it can get a good bite in whatever kind of ground that you're in. Most grounds work well for this one as well. This is a plow anchor. What's great about these guys is that um, they're designed to dig and dig in very deep. So it is able to hold its original bite for a long time, as well as this has the radius of about 60 to 90 degrees. Um, if there was a big change in the way your big boat was facing, um, some of the new ones have a bail on the back, which will also help it um, reset easily, but it also might drag a little bit longer than the other anchors you've seen here. This is also good for most grounds. Okay, so those are the most common uh, anchors that um, I think we'll, you'll find, uh, unless you're looking at more modern or very new boats. Um, obviously, the, the market for anchors is really large right now, and there is a nonstop evolution, um, slight increments or slightly new de designs, but um, these are what you're most likely to see out in the Sea Scout community and general small boat community. This is okay. Um, the next probably most common would be the North Hill. Um, and we'll go ahead and play a short clip. Uh, that's based from the Sea Scout manual. Another comparable model is the North Hill. This anchor is light and relatively efficient. The North Hill has a stock at the crown instead of the ring at the end, adding to the anchor's holding power when the flukes are buried. The arms are at right angles to the shank and the broad flukes are set at a carefully engineered angle to ensure a quick bite into the bottom. Right, so the uh, biggest advantage um, obviously is stowing. The North was originally invented to be a compact uh, anchor for seaplanes, actually. Um, something would fold really small and fairly light and would work in most bottoms. Um, however, the, because the flukes are um, very sharply raked, they will get a quick bite, but they have a tendency also to get snags. So you gotta be careful in rocks in particular, um, and um, just be conscious. But you're not gonna see them that much. They were very popular in the 1960s. Um, you do still see them from time to time, um, but typically they're on uh, smaller boats under 40 feet in length. Another compare. Okay, next up is the mushroom anchor. The mushroom anchor is a, stand, is a standard for permanent moorings. In heavy weights, it has excellent holding power. It has a cast iron bowl at the bottom of the shank. So this basically works by digging its way into the bottom over time. And that's right. So you'll either see very large versions of the mushroom anchor that are uh, several hundred pounds to over a thousand pounds um, very, very easily. And they're really used for permanent mooring. Um, that small one you see there uh, is really almost a lunch hook for a very small craft. Um, and it's, it would have to be in sheltered conditions. It, it will get a bite um, and the advantage is it does roll on the bottom, but it's really meant to, because of its weight, set on the bottom uh, and slowly sink into sediment over time. And over a couple of years, additional sediment buildup will just leave the, uh, the end of the shank out with the uh, the mooring cable or, or chain. And you used to see these were very common on light ships. And if you go to a light ship museum, um, you'll probably see one up on the bow. The okay, the next up is the homemade anchor. You can fashion a simple anchor by placing a large bolt into a number 10 can and then filling the can with concrete. This is suitable only for very small boats in calm waters. This is typically used for either, like it said, small boats in very light conditions, or sometimes can be used um, by Coast Guards within the 5,000 to 16,000 pounds. Okay, um, not very common on the coast, simply because they, they really, uh, 
they have no flukes. So the only thing that's going to grab would be the top or bottom, well, really the top edge. Um, so they just hold by weight. Um, concrete, uh, depending on how it's cast, may have issues in sitting in water for a long time as well. Um, but it is what the Coast Guard uses in the really large sinkers. And um, those will simply hold by, by weight um, in addition to the, uh, the chain that they have for their mooring. Okay, next up is the grapnel. The grapnel is frequently used by small crafts for temporary use. It has three or more flukes uplifted around the shank. It is handy is a handy piece of equipment for retrieving gear lost overboard by dragging along the bottom. It, it is actually a, a great thing to have um, on your boat, um, not really as a, a primary anchoring uh, piece of equipment, but for something to uh, re retrieve things that go over the side, um, help salvage a, a boat that's, um, you know, partially flooded or completely submerged, um, or obviously be a larger version. But really, um, it's also kind of for a smaller craft, it's very convenient in kayaks and things like that um, to deploy if you're going to really drop a launch hook. But those flukes um, easily get snagged in rocks, um, very difficult to dislodge, and there's probably tens of thousands of grapnel anchors all over our coast from people who have lost them uh, while using them uh, to fish something out of the water. Okay. The grapnel. And the sea anchor. A sea anchor is used to stabilize a boat in heavy weather by providing drag and slowing the vessel. Since it does not attach to the sea bottom, the sea anchor acts as a brake by pulling large amounts of water along as the boat moves forward to counter the effects of the high winds. Sea anchor safety provides from, a, from spare parts on board if a commercial sea anchor or drug is unavailable. Commercial sea anchors are typically shaped like a parachute or cone. They float just below the surface of the water with the larger end pointing to the direction of the boat's movement. And that's really it. It is uh, essentially a drag chute. Um, it is something that's really handy to have. Um, you know, if you're in an emergency situation where you've lost your propulsion and your drift, um, either offshore or especially when you're approaching or getting near shore to slow yourself down, but you need to be conscious of uh, other traffic if you're deploying it because uh, it tends to um, lead straight off the, the bow of the vessel, but it will keep the bow into weather, which gives her a better ride. And um, you can also, like she said, improvise. Um, I've seen a bucket used for a smaller boat that um, will at least help uh, keep the boat pointed uh, into the wind until um, repair, repair can be effected. I see. Okay, so uh, sheet anchor. Um, which some of you may or may not know, uh, originally was a anchor that was kept on the waist of a ship. And that would be um, sort of an emergency anchor if the, uh, the main anchors for the vessel were lost. Um, but now it's kind of uh, transposed as an expression uh, from a nautical origin on uh, someone who's particularly reliable and can always be called on in an emergency. Okay, so there's a lot of other designs we didn't cover here, mostly because um, they're either very new or uh, not really established as kind of a norm for uh, designs. The Delta is fairly similar to the Plow, the Rockna. The Claws, um, you'll see, especially in a lot of sailboats and cruisers, um, it's particularly good in uh, like uh, Kelpie or, or uh, Sandy Bottoms. And the fold and hold is basically a square, flat square anchor that pops up. So it's meant to take uh, very little space. So that's it for 8B. Um, that's a range of uh, 10 anchors that we discussed and four more that you can look more up on. Um, but being able to describe five of those, um, particularly if you have uh, five at your unit and describe how they uh, are used, should be very comfortable and conversant. Um, to go get those if, if needed during uh, an anchoring an anchoring detail. Okay, Abel, 8B, identify the parts of the anchor cable starting with the anchor and ending with the vessel. Um, this one's a little challenging um, 
because there's only a handful of examples available, um, you may see uh, different constructed assemblies, but this is about the closest we could get to a uh, standard anchor cable. And uh, here we go. Right on. All right, so this is ABLE requirement 8B for ground tackle. Uh, all components of the anchoring material should be joined with good quality galvanized shackles, and the line should have an eye with a thimble where it meets the chain to reduce abrasion as much as possible. In constructing a proper anchor, in constructing a proper anchor road, limit the working load to one fifth of the rated breaking strength of the rope and one half of the proof test of the chain used. Thus, a boat developing a load of some two thousand pounds should have a road in which the rope is rated at ten thousand pounds. So here we have two examples of anchor We have one that's using a dampful anchor and one that's using an able anchor. Uh, to start off, your anchor cables, you obviously have your anchors, which leads into either a shackle or a ring. In this case, these shackles don't have, these anchors don't have rings, so we're going to be using shackles. Uh, when you have your shackles, you want to make sure your ankle, your shackle keys have these seizing wires or safety wires. Because if I try to unscrew it here, it's just not going to come off because you have that wire. That helps you prevent uh, you from losing your anchors. After your shackles, you're going to have your chain or your shot. These help uh, weigh down your anchors and prevents it from getting caught or like, foiled as if you had rope. After your chain, you're going to go back to anchors. I uh, mean shackles. <laughs> you're going to connect your shackles to the thimble and the ice splice. So when you have your ice splice, you want to make sure you have that thimble to prevent abrasion. Because if I didn't have that thimble right here, it would just wear and tear away until your rope is gone. All you, would be ha all you have is your rope and no anchor. And same thing as before, when you have your shackles, you want to make sure you have that seizing wire here. If you look for at the naval anchor, this one doesn't have that wire, so I could just unscrew it right here, right now. So whenever you're getting shackles, make sure you have that wire just to keep that shackle secure. After that, you make sure for your thimble, you're gonna have that sheet, uh, you're gonna have like threads or something, just to keep that uh, spice tight. Season. This one obviously has it, but for the naval one, it just has the tucks and it's only four of them. So eventually it's gonna fall off. So whenever you're setting up your anchor cable, you wanna make sure that it's tight and secure so you won't lose anything. After that, um, whenever you wanna stow your anchor cables, you can have these bags, like these ones. They're perfect for stowing the roads. So what you can do is, if you want, you can take off the shackle and only store the rope because obviously there's not enough space for the anchors. But when you're stowing your rope, you can coil it up, make sure it's dry, make sure it's clean, so it's not going to get all mucky next time you try to use it. So when you stow it, just put it in the bag. You can put your anchor separately, but as long as you know where it is and how to set it up, it should be fine. All right, so Okay, so um, uh, just a couple notes here on the uh, the anchor cable, um, and this throws people off because they often think when you say cable, you're thinking wire cable, and that's not necessarily the case. In fact, really, most likely to see wire cables on commercial or military uh, anchoring or complex mooring rigs. Um, but we're referring here is to the anchor line, the chain shot, and uh, all the hardware between the anchor and the boat. Um, another thing that's missing here in these examples uh, that you really want to have is your anchor cable swivel. Um, a lot of times it'll either be galvanized or stainless, but it's really important, particularly if you're using a three strand line, which is fairly common um, because it has a tendency as the anchor may roll around or when you're putting it to power, um, it, it may have a tendency to knot up or get all kinked up and chain can do the same thing. So having at least one swivel um, and maybe some, some arrangements may have two, somewhere in the rig, usually at the shackle to the anchor on the cable, um, that's a really smart move to do. And it should be appropriately sized for the chain and the, uh, the anchor eye um, and the shackle. So it should be consistent with the rest of the strength of the rig. Um, something not really covered in the CSCAP manual, but is um, just something to consider are trip lines and anchor buoys. These are things uh, that you can set up in your anchor cable rig when you deploy it. Um, anchor 
buoy is tethered to the anchor itself directly and it does a couple things. One, you can see where the anchor is actually deployed as you swing around it and it might give you a sense too if it's dragging along with the anchor cable. And trip lines. Um, if you have particular difficulty dislodging the anchor from the bottom once you get it to short stay when you're recovering it, you can sometimes just uh, pull up on the trip line and that basically backs the anchor out uh, from the back from whatever it's, it's lodged on in the bottom. So something to consider, um, not required, but it, it may be a smart thing to have for your, uh, your outfit on your boat. Um, there's various cable arrangements. Uh, sometimes you can deploy two anchors, a bow anchor and a stern anchor, or three-way anchor arrangement um, to stabilize the boat, minimize the swing. Um, but the same consideration should apply uh, because if current or wind, whatever the prevailing condition is, shifts uh, during throughout the day, both anchors are going to have the same amount of strain given the shape of the boat and uh, that the, the bow or stern has. So um, give that consideration putting it together. Stern anchor isn't necessarily a weaker anchor, um, as some, some may think. Um, secured to deck fittings. Okay, so uh, depending on the kind of anchor cable you have, uh, you may have it made down on a Samson post. Um, it may have stoppers or um, some other sort of, uh, static fitting, um, so it's not just left wrapped around a capstan or uh, wildcat on the, the uh, hoisting apparatus, uh, the winch apparatus. Um, and it's possible too that while you may have a second anchor deployed that may be made fast while you're at anchor on a, uh, another fitting on the aft of the boat, um, when you hoist one anchor and, uh, and get it to the water's edge or aboard, then you can shift the line uh, to a different fitting and hoist the board from the, uh, from the bow. Um, another thing that's really important to remember here is always stow your anchor line clean and dry. Um, even double braid nylon, uh, if it's been on the bottom and there's grit, there's sand, there's all kinds of things that it will uh, absorb like a sponge. Um, just like three strand uh, line, it's really important to make sure that it's, it's clean and that you leave it out so it can dry because uh, mildew between the fibers can break down the line, break down the strength of the line or expand it, reduce its elasticity. So make sure you, uh, you, you stow everything correctly when you're, you're done with your evolution. Okay, so that's it for Able 8B. Okay, the final requirement we're covering tonight is ABLE 8E, identify uh, capstan or windlass and explain its use in handling line with rope or chain. Okay, so there's a little bit of a correction. We were going um, strictly based on the, uh, when we were constructing the, uh, the outline for this video uh, webinar, um, we're looking at the nomenclature that was strictly in the CSCAP manual. And um, so we had a little debate and what we came up with was to ascribe a couple parts um, as they were being pointed to in the video, they're not quite right. Um, I guess the only important thing before we start it, as you can see in the picture here, this is a very large wildcat that's um, on a battleship. Um, but the arrangement is basically, it's a cog wheel with sheaves on both sides and it captures and keeps the anchor chain um, in its firm grip. Um, the anchor, uh, some of the modern, some of these modern wildcats, um, they have alternative designs that sort of evolved. So where instead of a straight groove to hold the uh, stud link chain, um, it can shift from chain to uh, gripping uh, uh, rope or your, your anchor cable, your um, uh, double braid nylon or, or whatever material you're using and it cinches it down there as it passes around so it doesn't have a traditional drum with you know three turns on the top um, but anyway okay um, so the, the fundamentals are that they both let the anchor cable out under control with brake or they winch it in under power and they can also be used uh, for other applications on the boat, um, top side with your rigging for your master boom or your mooring lines. Um, and of course, uh, some of this may not be relevant because 
there's a lot of smaller boats that simply don't need it. Um, the anchors are so light that you can uh, um, handle them by hand. Okay, so let's get started. This is from the manual. The capstan is a rotating device operated by power or by hand employed on a boat aboard a ship for the application of extreme power to ropes and wires in the handling of heavy objects such as an anchor. The main element of the capstan is its upright drum or barrel, which distinguishes it from a windlass. Okay. And on to capstan parts. So here we have a capstan, and when looking at the capstan, you can see its base, which is right here, and then you can see its paw ring, which is from here to here, and these are also paws, these little things that catch the chain. Then you have its barrel or drum, and then this one doesn't have any welts or pigeonholes, but where the pigeonholes might have been is your drum disengagement and also your braking mechanism for it to stop. This is the head of the capstan, and then this um, collects the chain. Bringing the anchor up. Um, here are the two buttons, and it either out or brings up the anchor, depending on what button you press. So here we have. Okay, and then we'll talk about the windlass. All right, so if you don't want a capstan or it just doesn't work for your boat, you also have a windlass. Here, it's similar to a capstan, but it's horizontal. You still have the pull ring and the head, which is exactly the same as the capstan, but you don't have a barrel or a drum. Uh, here, you have the cat's paw. It helps keep the chain on the falls. Um, here, we have a motor just to help automate it. There are uh, manual versions if you just don't want to have a motor. On either side of the boat, you're going to have two controls, whether to um, pull the chain in or just release it. Uh, here, you also have the chain pipe. That's where the chain goes, which eventually goes into the chain box. And, yeah. Okay, again, uh, the chain, you can see, um, rolls over the wildcat that goes down into the uh, chain pipe. And of course, this boat is outfitted with a stopper as a pawl that rides um, to make sure that the chain doesn't ride back. Before you deploy an anchor, obviously you need to make sure all the chain stoppers are clear. Okay, so Able 8E footnotes. Um, there's discussion, you'll see it, especially through older reference about pigeon bars, basically before electric powered motors or steam powered motors, um, all the capstans or windlasses would be turned manually and pigeon bars are simply uh, bar that would be about six to eight feet long, um, depending on the arrangement that would go in a socket and a group of uh, um, sailors would push that around slowly while uh, multiple turns on the uh, drum would uh, would keep around online. And uh, the pawls, especially in those days, were actually sort of like a uh, um, in-facing gear arrangement that had ratchets. So as it rode around, it wouldn't back out of control. All right, so um, an important thing to note too, especially with older boats that uh, need replacement of their uh, drive motor and uh, or the entire capstan or windlass arrangement, um, these things have to be specifically um, verified for use on the kind of boat that you're using with the sort of anchor arrangement that you're going to use. Um, there's specific tolerances for how much load they can handle. Um, of course, what is the capacity that both support the load of the motor itself? And uh, they need to be maintained. These things uh, are often overlooked in maintenance on boats um, because people use them so infrequently. And uh, it's not uncommon, especially for the motors and gears, if they're not properly lubricated and main maintained to, uh, to fail over time. Okay, so why of a windlass over a capstan or vice versa? This really depends on the way that a line or, or a chain needs to fair lead onto the boat, specifically uh, for anchor cables as they feed down below, how far aft it is, what's the fair lead or the angle from the point at which it comes over the rail or bowsprit. Um, and that's the same thing if you see uh, capstans or windlasses on the rest of the boat. Capstans obviously are 
usually easier to work on if you are positioned over them through like a manual capstan um, for handling lines. But it really just depends on the, the fair lead angle and how the line would be practically handled um, around the drum. Okay, um, Paul is part of a chain stopper, um, and we talked about this earlier, and it's basically a piece that rides um, sort of like a flapper over chain links as they're coming in, and it prevents if it were to, for some reason, lose brake control, the chain to back out uh, uncontrolled, um, and also would secure the anchor when it's housed or in its pocket. Okay. All right, so, this is a lot of uh, a lot of content in terms of uh, nomenclature and definitions and uh, d descriptions and considerations, right? Well, that's not all that exciting until you actually go and deploy an anchor. Um, here in Area 3, we're big fans of the 26-foot Navy motor whaleboats. Um, they're great training platforms because a bunch of people can be on board and see what's going on um, in the, uh, the open, open hull arrangement. Um, they're also just about the biggest size that you're not gonna have some sort of uh, capstan or windlass to heave around an anchor. Um, so everything can be handled by hand. We'll play a short video clip of uh, some training we've done here uh, over the last few years, both in Lake Tahoe and also uh, here in the San Francisco Bay. Okay, and there you can see the end of the, uh, the anchor line is already made fast to a Samson post and hand, handling it hand over hand safely over the side, um, never being outboard and uh, careful to not let hands near the cleats um, as it's moving. Now, ideally, the boat should be at full stop when you uh, lower away the anchor. Um, this instance, we're pretty much at a full stop. You see the anchoring going down, um, we don't throw anchors. That's a cool view. Uh, I think that was actually in Tahoe. And here we are paying out line. And um, having someone on the bow pointing in the direction how the line is tending. So whoever's driving the boat um, has an idea uh, as the boat's backing down if it uh, is dragging or if the boat's shifting, it just gives reference um, to make sure that the line is not tending aft towards the uh, control surfaces in the stern of the boat. Okay, so that's just a real quick demonstration. And um, at this point, um, I would open it up for a discussion. Um, I have some sample questions here and I'll leave it to the moderator to bring these up. Um, I can answer some of these questions. Um, some of them are, are really based on uh, your particular preference or your experiential opinion. Um, but let's go ahead and open this up for, for questions. So we have questions that are starting to come in. And uh, again, more of a comment. I thought Lake Tahoe was bottomless. No, it's not, but it is super deep. It's like the same depth that the Titanic is at. So it's way down there. Uh, but yes, it's super blue and very clear and we were able to uh, get some amazing footage uh, a few years ago. Let's, uh, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A uh, box and we will answer it. So, you know, the uh, pre-questions that we have here, uh, Chris, how does this material relate to other requirements? Okay, so uh, before you can really get into handling any type of equipment, you need to have a, a, a pretty solid foundation on what the equipment is and how it's intended to operate before you can get into commands or how would you deploy that equipment when you're operating your boat in different conditions in different places. And you also, it, it, it's, it, because it's not an abstraction, you're, you're familiar with what's being talked about in other content. Now, you'll notice some of these requirements are not necessarily in sequence um, to how they're listed in the Sea Scout manual, but we looked at that and took into consideration that if you're getting into the other advancement uh, requirements, um, and, you, you, and it talks about really more of how would you plan to use these things? You need to have a basis and background of, of the hardware 
and how the hardware works best. Are there, are these questions uh, absolute answers to outfitting your boat? And since you use the word absolute, I'm gonna go with no. And uh, can you explain why? Because nothing's absolute. Yeah, it's, it's maybe a, a bit of a rhetorical question to sort of, to provoke. Um, there are people with very firm answers that are absolute, um, that are their personal uh, rules for boating. If you go on the internet, you know that just about any topic has millions of opinions. Some of them are hard to really discern if, if they're credible or not. Um, there is no absolute answer. And the best way to really get a level of comfort with whether you have a good outfit is to go out and practice. Practice in different conditions, practice in different locations. Um, and I would say a, a great way too is also to cruise with another unit or do activities on other people's boats and see how their outfit works, um, especially for anchoring. Anchoring, yes, it's an alternative to mooring if you're on a long cruise, but it is also really your emergent, it is your really, your, your only emergency break on the vessel. Um, and being familiar with anchoring just in the spots that you like to anchor or would prefer to anchor, uh, doesn't mean you're really prepared, um, if you're transiting all kinds of different locations with different bottoms, different depths, different traffic, all these different considerations, um, go out and test these things, cruise with other units, talk with people and inform your own opinion. Um, but recognize that uh, boats are never done teaching you. So uh, keep an open mind uh, as you go on. So Here's one that, uh, you know, we frequently say never throw an anchor. So we have a question, why not? What's the reason for not throwing an anchor? Well, uh, you know, if you're throwing an anchor, it means you're probably not tending it around a, uh, a drum or wildcat that has some sort of brake control. Um, it is tempting and there's lots of examples on, on media and TV and a lot of people just have the habit of throwing the anchor out, throwing it clear of the vessel. Uh, one of the risks of doing that is if you've faked out your anchor cable on the deck, once you throw an anchor, you're already starting a lot of momentum and there is an opportunity for the line to get caught on someone or to be whipping through the air as it's going very quickly over the side and you don't really have control of it until you get to a point where either the anchor hits the bottom definitively um, or uh, the bitter end which may be tied down um, there's there's really no control in between those two points um, tending it carefully knowing the depth if you don't have a depth sounder use a sounding uh, you know take a sounding manually but know what you're getting into if you have the time to, to, to do that. Um, and even in an emergency, you wanna have an idea of what kind of depth, because obviously you're gonna be figuring out scope and things like that that are another requirement. Um, but really, it's not the greatest habit in my experience. Um, lowering anchor under control, yes, on a larger vessel where you've got a, a brakeman and someone at the uh, controls of the windlass and you're doing it in a much more structured way. Initially, uh, when you, release the whatever anchor you're using, it's gonna go down at its full momentum. The chain's gonna be flying around the wildcat, uh, hence its name. So um, that, that's a different situation, but that's not a situation where you'd simply be throwing the anchor while it's also uh, around a control, control device. Um, I think that's about the best answer I can give. So, what do you think are examples of a good boat outfit for uh, a, a ground tackle setup? Best case scenario. Well, ideally, I mean, it all depends on the vessel you have. Um, you can get a bad out, but boat outfit with a donation you get, and it is what it is. You get the material in it, but you know, you take the time to look at the vessel, do the calculations on what are probable, um, loads that the anchor cable is going to be placed under. 
uh, in the kinds of places that you go with the particular dimensions of your vessel. I mean, do the math uh, and then figure out what you want as your primary anchor or anchor cable and uh, as well as a secondary or a backup. And your secondary backup may be also the thing that you use for a stern anchor. Um, but having redundancy in the boat as much as practical is usually a good idea. If something fails and having something else to lean on, um, I'll give a real quick sea story. I was on the, the Bark Eagle as a bosun's mate and we were at anchor off Miami Beach and we had a microburst directly over the ship and we dragged uh, anchor for about a mile and a half um, realizing that we simply weren't getting a hold and of course we released our we had the port anchor out and we released our starboard anchor and that finally with enough chain you know gave the coefficient of friction to bring the ship to a stop under heavy winds which were, uh, were blowing at uh, 60 to 70 knots it was quite an event but you, if your first, your primary system fails, it's always a good idea to have a secondary system. And uh, the same thing goes for your boat outfit. Anything can go overboard. So, uh, and of course, some people don't, <laughs> don't keep a mind of when they're tending their anchor out necessarily how much is left or whether it's, it's got to turn around anything. And uh, there are more than a few anchors on the bottom because uh, people lost awareness. So having a second, uh, second anchor is always a good idea. And in addition, if the boat is really impractical to hand tend line on, um, definitely consider installing a wind nest. And of course, you'd want to get professional consultation when you do that. But um, you, you want to have a practical outfit that you're going to be able to handle with the number of people you could count on to be on your crew. And that should all be factored in. We have a great question. And we could give this as a supplemental list or in a future webinar. Uh, and the, the question is, what would you give examples of commands for deploying, retrieving your anchor? Do you use hand signals between bow and helm? Um, it really depends on the, out, the layout of the vessel, how big it is, um, how many people you're talking about in your evolution. Um, and the, the commands are really, it's really content for other advancement requirements really. Um, whether you used hand signals or voice command. Um, if you're using hand signals, that requires people to be watching one person. Um, so for instance, when I was on a buoy tender as a, as a, a non-rate, um, everyone's gonna be watching either safety officer or the buoy deck cap leader, right? So that's a natural course of the evolution when you're putting an anchor over the side, typically people are arranged around the boat in positions where they may or may not be able to see a hand signal. But if you're using voice commands, especially if you're using radios, if the boat's big enough, um, or you can use a loud hailer alternatively. Um, ideally, if people have their attention on what they're doing and their eyes are on what they're doing, um, I'm a little bit more in favor of voice commands. Um, but your typical command would be to let go an anchor uh, and then give commands to whoever's handling the uh, windlass controller and the brakeman um, to speed up or slow down the release of the anchor cable or chain uh, and counting out shots, fathoms as they go out. So everyone's aware of how far, how much uh, anchor chain is out and gives them an idea of how close they're getting to when they need to slow down the release and be prepared to set the stopper and uh, and watch if the uh, anchor chain is apparently holding. Um, so there's a lot of people in that evolution. It, it can be fairly com uh, complicated. Now, if it's just a couple people in a boat, then uh, ideally you should be able to pass commands um, directly. And it, it's, it's a bit more simple. And the more you practice it, uh, the probably the less correction or corrective detail there is. A crew, a really tuned crew knows how to do this uh, confidently and uh, has already talked before they started the evolution. That's one of the biggest things too, is if you're not, it doesn't matter whether you anchor a lot or, or, or anchor fairly infrequently, just the minimum that you need to, it's always important to get everyone together and talk about what you're gonna do beforehand what are the conditions? How deep is the water? How much uh, cable or chains going over the side? And uh, make sure everyone understands that 
you know, from, from the beginning to the point where you secure and set the anchor watch, um, what's going to happen and what may alternatively happen uh, if things don't go uh, per plan. I hope that's, that's about as much as I can get into without uh, outlining an entire anchor evolution. Which again, that can be a separate webinar or when we uh, can really get back on the water, try to do something live, uh, but one step at a time. So, but a very, very good question. Well, uh, Chris, want to thank you for your time. That was the last question that we had. Uh, we will have more webinars in the month of July. We have a piloting one coming up on July 6th and uh, with part two on July 8th. There will be another Coast Guard Auxiliary webinar uh, as well. And we're recruiting speakers for a couple other uh, ideas that we have that can be helpful. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in on Zoom and Facebook Live. And Chris, thank you for your time and expertise. And everyone, have a wonderful evening. Thank you and take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.